come before you, Lord, and we just, we just ask for grace tonight. Father, we ask for grace in our dealings, in our thinking, in the way we do, the way we serve. Father, I pray that you would help us to lean into you more. That, Father, we would um, try to decide in, in, in our own life, Father, how much presence of, of you that we want in it. Father, that we would seek you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That we would serve you, Father, equally. Father, we thank you for the servants here at Mount Carmel. We thank you uh, Mount Carmel, for Calvary. Father, we thank you for all the folks um, that we've got on our prayer list that we can lift up prayer requests for. We thank you for the opportunity and the responsibility we have in that. Lord, for those that we know in different places that we're praying for, uh, Lord, I pray that you will just continue to, to, to give them what they need in their hour of need. Father, pray for the families tomorrow that are, are in a state of bereavement right now, Father, as they go through a time of memorial. Father, that you would bless them and hold them dear to you. Father, we pray for strength in the upcoming days. Lord, we lift up our nation as we look around. And, Father, it's hard to recognize at times. Um, who we are, where we're from, and where we're going. Father, we pray for the wars that are going on. Father, we pray for Israel. Father, we also pray for the innocents that, our Father, are being killed in that war. Um, Lord, I know it's caused a lot of turmoil in this nation. Uh, so, Father, I just pray that your, your people would bow their knee to you and that we would seek your presence in all these situations. Lord, help us tonight as we walk into Philippians again, as we look at a little bit more of the conflict in the church there at Philippi. Father, help us to learn from that. Help us to see a path in every situation that we find ourselves in. And Father, may we understand these deep truths that Paul writes about this very night. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. I would say that I was thinking about my friend at Mount Carmel that's in the hospital. The truth of the matter is, Mount Carmel is allowed to come out of my mouth as easily as Calvary. And, I, and I've, I've almost been here five years. 19th of May will be five years. Um, with COVID in the middle of it, it seems like I've had two pastorates already here. Pre-COVID and post-COVID. Um, but we are thankful um, for the sister churches that we have and the friends that we have that serve in other churches. Um, thinking, talking to Ira and uh, Gladys tonight about Swallowfield up the road from us. And the great work that they're doing there. Uh, the immense amount of children that they have there. Um, compared to the adult that they have. So it's just, it's just amazing what God is doing in our sister churches. And let's always remember that, you know, we're not competing. We're in this together. And um, we pray for the churches around us that are serving the Lord. Well, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. Last chapter of the book. We're working through it. We're going to look at a few verses tonight. So let me kind of bring you up to speed on where we're at and what we looked at last week and then where we're going to go from there. Um, tonight. So, so last week I, I kind of pointed out the fact that Paul's finally getting around to some of the things he said, said throughout the book. You know, he's talked early on in the book to think, you know, don't think of yourself too highly. Esteem others as greater than yourself. He's talked about being humble. He's talked about having a service mindset. And, and I think a lot of that through the book, not only was he thanking them for the gift that he received from them, not only was he mentioning Epaphroditus and all that he brought Paul and how the Epaphroditus got sick and, and Paul's situation in jail. He was, he was updating them. And so let's keep it in our mind that this is a, a little private letter that Paul sent back to this little church in Philippi. I don't know how big they were. Uh, but Paul sent this letter back, kind of an update. It, it was, you know, a supporting church. It's like a, a missionary that was writing back to their supporting church and just updating them. But he's also really candid with these people because he knows them. He knows them personally. And he mentions throughout the book how much he loves them and how they're they're so near and dear to his heart and so he's wanting to instruct them because they are near and dear to him he didn't have a lot of correction to do but then we saw last week that he kind of dropped some names now before we go back into these names again remember what we talked about that he, he's not talking about major heresy or big sins in the church he, there's just a couple ladies in the church that have some sort of conflict we're never really explained what the conflict was and what it was about. We looked at a couple of possibilities last week. Um, but he encouraged uh, both Iodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. And then he goes through this, this just a little short discourse that I'm going to add to tonight. And so we're going to start at verse 2, but we're going to look at verse 4 um, through 7 tonight. So he says, I entreat Iodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together 
with Clement and the rest of the fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So I, I kind of see this as an introduction. He's talking about, listen, y'all need to fix what's going on. And we, we mentioned how, how awkward it might be if we got a letter from Paul and we were reading it. And he named a couple people in the church that, you know, everybody knew they were having a little bit of squabble. But now word's gotten back to Paul and Paul's now addressing this squabble in the church. But he's not, he's not addressing them as though they've gotten wavered. He's not addressing them as though they've fallen into some big sin that he's got to name out and, and squash out like he does in the book of Corinthians or things that he mentions in Galatians. He, he, he doesn't have any hostility whatsoever, but he's just urging these ladies to kind of remember who you are. And he urging the people not to judge them too harshly because these, these, these ladies are workers. They served along with Paul and along with Clement and, and their names are recorded in the book of life. These are servants of God, but there's something that's happened that they've had a little bit of falling out over. I think one of them probably took the other one's casserole home and kept it as her own. You know, something along that line. I, I don't know what it was. Um, I assume they're Baptists, so I assume casseroles are involved. Amen. All right. But listen to what he says. He said, they work side by side with me in the gospel, with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers. You get a sense here the interpersonal relationship that Paul had, that he just mentions these people, and everybody knows who, who he's talking about and, and how much they meant to him. And then we get to one of the more famous verses of Philippians that most people know, but I want you to understand that I believe that it's tied to the situation going on because he doesn't say, he doesn't kind of change the topic. He just throws in the very next thing. So if you, if you my Bible has an indent there at verse 4. Uh, I know some people have Bibles that are like dual column and every verse is indented a little bit. Um, but I, I think whoever was putting this translation together, they kind of want to make this a separate verse because this is something that you see in bumper stickers or, or, or you see, you know, as covers of um, devotional books and things like that. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, the next verse, he says, finally, brothers. So I, th I want you to understand that I believe that this whole section I just read, where he starts off um, chapter 4 with the therefore, and he finishes up his previous thought, and then he starts with I entreat. And he, so he, he talks about Sintiki, and, and I love that name, in, in Euodia, another you know, fabulous name that I'm, I'm surprised we're not using it today. But... <laughs> He refers to these two ladies, and, and then he, he talks about them agreeing in the Lord. And we talked about last week having the mind of Christ, that we should be united, that Christ should be our purpose. Whatever disagreements we have, you will not, you will not have disagreements that get out of control or get very large without selfishness being involved. Amen? Some people have to have it their way. And they're going to fight until they have their way. And then some people, because they can't have it their way, what are they going to do? They're going to quit, walk away. Or they're going to leave. Or they're going to withdraw fellowship from this person. I mean, we see that. But you can't have that kind of disagreement that there's not something selfish going on. So I don't know what it was between these two ladies. And, and I kind of believe it was probably between these two ladies and maybe the leadership of the church. I, I think these ladies were probably in some sort of position of leadership. They've probably been around for a long time. Had some sort of authority. They were heading something up. I, I don't know. We, we're not told. It's not explained in church history. But these are two people that everybody would have known. These are probably, you know, regulars at the church. They're probably a part of everything going on. So he could just name them that way. He doesn't name people like this unless they've done him great harm or he has great love for them. That's kind of how Paul does. And so he names these two ladies. He says, listen, I, I'm urging you. I'm urging you. And, and he repeats it to both, to agree in the Lord. If nothing else, just agree that you're here to serve the Lord. Because you can disagree agreeably. Amen? Paul doesn't say have the same opinion. He doesn't say that you, you've got to say, well, one of them's right and the other one's wrong. He, he's not even wading into that. He simply says, you two ladies, you're servants of God. You've served well. You've served with me. Your names are in the book of life. You need to put whatever this is behind you. And I think with that in mind, he simply goes into the very next verse, which is rejoice in the Lord always. Now, can you imagine if you're having a squabble with one of your friends, be it guy or be it gal, if you're having a squabble, you're not getting along, you're probably not rejoicing. 
You're having, you're having a, a fit with somebody. You're just disagreeing. You're probably not rejoicing. Rejoicing is one of those things. It's a true Christian trait, and it comes from the peace of God and the presence of God and the, the understanding, and it comes from a Jesus mindset. And so if our focus is Jesus, if our focus is to lean into Christ, and we understand, first of all, if we understand who we were as sinners and who we are as forgiven, we can be in a perpetual state of worship first and foremost. Secondly, we're going to want everything we do to bring Christ honor and glory. But you'll notice that sometimes we, we still do the churchy stuff, but we have a falling out with the people that sit around the tables with us, or we have a falling out with somebody who sits a few pews over, or we have a falling out and, and we get really selfish. And when we start getting really selfish, we don't have our mind on Christ. We don't have our mind where it needs to be. So we quit rejoicing. We get kind of humped up, I've heard people say. You ever, you ever been around people that are just kind of humped up? Can't tell what they're mad about, but they're mad nonetheless. They just have something going on. There, there's no kind words that are spoken. So Paul's re telling these people that they have a correction that they need to make. They need to rejoice. And he puts emphasis on this. By the way, it's a command. He's commanding them, which seems weird. I command you to rejoice. It's like, I'm telling you, be happy. It just <laughs> comes across different. But listen to what Paul says. He says, rejoice. You're, you're having some sort of squabble. Forget about that. Agree in the Lord that you're going to serve. Maybe you have to now serve on two different committees. Maybe somebody got appointed chairman of the committee and somebody else didn't get appointed of the chairmanship committee. Now, that sounds trivial, doesn't it? You know how many conversations I've had throughout 30 years of people who are upset because somebody had a position they wanted? These are Sunday school teachers. These are leaders. These are people that serve, and they wanted a position that somebody else got. You know what they did? They got upset over it. They got mad over it. It was mine to have. And, and okay, here's what I want to tell them, although I usually don't because I try to be nicer, is your focus is no longer Christ. Your focus is you. And therefore, you're having trouble worshiping, and you're sure not rejoicing. Because that's exactly what Paul says here. People don't like to hear that, though. If you come to me, and you want to grumble because somebody else has done something you didn't like, and I tell you this, you're never going to come to me again, are you? <laughs> you your own problem, right? Well, this is what Paul's saying. He's following this up with rejoice in the Lord always. Now, think about the power of that statement. Rejoice in the Lord, because that's the only place you're going to be able to find rejoicing. Because if you understand who you are in your sin debt, if you understand who you were when you were fallen, if you understand what was inflicted on Christ because of your actions and your choices in life, and you realize he died for you anyway, rejoice in the Lord. If we can think about who we are in Christ, it should prompt rejoicing in worship. Rejoicing is a form of worship. Service is a form of worship. Tithing, giving is a form of worship. Gathering and singing is a form of worship. And, and I think a lot of times we forget that, that, that washing dishes is a form of worship. Bringing, bringing food and putting it on a table on a Wednesday night. Well, maybe you're already tired or whatever else. It's a form of worship. Now, maybe you didn't consider that. And maybe considering that would help you in your understanding that I'm, I'm bringing these cookies to church. I didn't buy them. I mean, I didn't make them. I bought them because I didn't have time. But I'm taking these cookies to church. Not because I feel obligated to bring food, because it is a Baptist church and people sometimes feel obligated, but because I want to be a part of what God's doing at this church. And this is a form of worship. Now, when we don't think that way, things like bringing food becomes a grudge, drudgery even sometimes. Sometimes showing up, if, if you're vacuuming the church, I've known all kinds of families throughout the years that would vacuum the churches, and they would rotate families throughout the week. And I've known several that when it was their week to vacuum, they absolutely hated it. They hated to go vacuum the church. Would complain and say, I don't know why we don't hire somebody to vacuum this carpet. Why do we have to go? A lot of times it was their kids that was making it hard to go because they didn't want to go to church and vacuum the church. And so it was no longer worship. It had become a waste instead of worship. And see, I think Paul's trying to get these two, these two individuals, but... Paul's telling these two individuals in such a way that everybody gathered around the tables would also hear it and think, hmm. Because these people say, you know, they're just, they're just not getting along on what's an accurate 
casserole dish. I mean, this is minor. They're just not getting along because we did this instead of that. It's, it's no big deal, but Paul's calling them out on that. And Paul's identifying that their problem is they're not rejoicing because they're not focused correctly. See, that's what happens. We, we get our focus off Christ, and then any little thing bothers us. And I've seen that. I've seen that in my whole ministry where people, people love everything going on until some little something happens. Next thing you know, they don't like the color of the carpet. Next thing you know, they don't like the time that we start. Next thing you know, we don't like the song set that we did Sunday. Next thing you know, it's, and it, next thing you know, it's just more and more and more. And it only happens because we get selfish. We want to have it our way. We know better, right? My taste is better than anybody else's taste. And we get self-focused. We take our eyes off of Christ, guaranteed 100%. We put our eyes on our thoughts, our wants instead of the wants and needs of others. And we get bent out of shape. Or we get just a little bit twisted out of shape. But even if you're just a little twisted out of shape, your eyes are still on you, not on God. And so Paul said, listen, rejoice. And again I say, rejoice in the Lord. He, he, he gives them this imperative. He gives it to them twice for emphasis. There's, anytime you see a word repeated in Scripture, study that word out. So he's telling them to rejoice, to celebrate, to praise God, to be excited about who you are and your opportunity to to, to do what he wants you to do. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness. Now, it's interesting because there's a lot of different translations for this word. It's a complicated word to translate, but one of the best ones that I heard is you could write sweet reasonableness in there. Disposition. How many of you have disposition in there? Gentle spirit. There's a lot of ways to translate this word. Is That's what it's coming to. He's, he's, I think he's telling these two ladies... And for all the church to hear, and for us also, he says, listen, let your gentle spirit, let your sweet reasonableness be known to everyone. Not only in the church, but out. We, we, we should never be so dogmatic and, and so angry and so assertive and so gung-ho that people are afraid of us. Don't, you know, don't. Don't do that around the Christians. They get bent out of shape. You know, that kind of stuff that a lot of the world sees today. Because they see us as judge. They see us as a gatekeeper. They don't see us as loving. They don't see us as representing Christ. They see us as the ones to tell them what they're wrong with. But Paul says, let them see your sweet reasonableness. Now, these two ladies are not getting along. And Paul says, I know who you are. You're both very dedicated. You're both servants of the Lord. Your names are on the book of life. And you're also sweet and you're reasonable. You've got a sweet disposition. In other words, they're acting out of character as a Christian. And Paul's telling them, let everybody see your Christian character, not your selfish attitude. Let it be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. That's a hard one to translate. The Lord is at hand. It either means in time, or it means in proximity, or it means in relationship. So pick whichever one of those you like and go with it because everybody else has picked one of those three. It's either in time, Paul believed that the Lord was coming back shortly. Peter believed the Lord was coming back shortly. John believed in Revelation that the Lord was coming back shortly. So this was kind of their view in short amount of time. So Paul's saying, listen, straighten up. Let's get, let's get busy about the king's work because he's at, he, he's at the gates. He's, he's ready to come back at any moment. Or... And here's what I think. I think it has to do with God's presence in the life of a believer, which was brand new in the New Testament. Remember, in the Old Testament, God did not reside in people. But since Pentecost, God has moved into the life of a believer, and he does not move out. So the Holy Spirit, God in person of the Spirit, is with us everywhere we go. So you can almost hear Paul saying, check your attitude. You're acting like kids right in front of God. You're, you're not acting like you should act. You need, to, you need to let your sweet reasonableness be known to everybody. The Lord's, the Lord's watching. Now, that doesn't affect a lot of people today. I've seen bumper stickers that says, Act right, Jesus is watching. Well, that's a little tongue-in-cheek. I mean, it's a little bit facetious. Probably borders on, the, on blasphemy, but that's on them, not on me. But, it's still, but, but what Paul's saying is, you know, the Lord's, the Lord's involved in this. 
everything you're struggling with, everything you're dealing with, all the complications, Jesus is right in the midst of that. So let's be sweet and reasonable the way we treat each other and let it be witnessed by everybody else because they sure do witness when we're not getting along and they watch it. So he says, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. Anybody have anxiety in here that you'll admit to? Okay. When, when your anxiety is, let's call it flared up, does it affect the way that you act or... You know, I, got, I woke up with one nerve today, and I'll be daggone if you didn't get right on it, right? Anxiety can be that way. The anxiety can make us react poorly. And this word anxiety means more than the anxiety what we mean today, but it means a fear. It, it means an unsureness of the future. Maybe if you're in a church and you found out the leadership done something that doesn't set right with you, you didn't think they should have done that, it can create anxiety in you because, you, you know, you begin to want to talk about it. Did you know? That we're playing bingo on Thursday night for money in the church basement? You ever had that conversation? I have had that conversation. And, and people get anxious over that. And, and they get worked up over it. Okay, these two ladies are not getting along. They can, you know, they're having anxiety, basically, by this definition, with one another. So Paul's telling them in front of the church for everybody else to hear, including us, don't be anxious. Now... Does anybody's translation say don't be anxious about anything or don't be anxious for nothing? You know, that, that's added. It's really not right there. What Paul says is don't be anxious. That's where it ends. Don't be anxious, but in everything, everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. So if you think about it, if a couple people, I mean, just keeping on in, in the spectrum that we're looking at, a couple of people or a few people or two sections of people aren't getting along in the church, how, do you think prayer might help things? <laughs> Last thing we want to do, though, is pray, unless we're praying about them, right? Those precatory prayers, y'all ever pray that? <laughs> Lord, I know he's your child. You want to take him home? That's fine with me. <laughs> That's David right out of the Psalms. It's called a precatory prayer. David would pray that way. We're not really given the right to do that, but I hold that sometimes. I got a precatory prayer I'll have to whip out here. Um, but he said, listen, don't be anxious, but everything, everything, which includes when you're anxious, which includes when you're rejoicing, which in includes when you feel right about things, is bathe it in prayer. Everything. Be don't be anxious, but everything in prayer. So when you feel this issue, or you feel this anxiety, you feel this struggle, or you feel um, a, 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 even, even like a depression about something that's going on, it's beginning to affect you, Paul says, take it to the Lord in prayer. Everything, take it to the Lord in prayer. No matter what it is. If you're happy, take it to the Lord in prayer. If you wake up and it's been a wonderful day, take it to the Lord in prayer. And listen to what he goes on. He says, he says, in everything, by prayer and supplication, which means the prayer means to be talking with God and having a conversation about what your needs are. The supplication is asking particularly for the things that you need. So you can come on there. Anybody here named Martha? So if I were praying and I was having trouble with a Martha at church, okay, I could, I could be praying, Lord, I'm struggling with Martha. I know you love her. And I know she's a servant. I know she's there every time the doors are open. But I just can't stand how she does her hair. <laughs> I, Lord... The perfume, she, I can't breathe when I'm around her, right? Lord, help me. Help me. Because who can you change in any situation, them or you? So our prayer, supplication should be, Lord, help me in my struggles with working with your child. Because I don't think God's the one that has the problem. You say, well, they're the one with the problem. Well, you can't do anything about them. All you can do is, is, you know, like I said last week, the problem's not the problem. The problem is your attitude about the problem. Lord, help me with my attitude about this situation. Everything that brings you some sort of anxiety, anything that brings you any, any sort of dis, dis, dis shoveling in your soul, in your spirit, anything that comes in. Paul says, listen, this shouldn't get to this position. This is something that should have been prayed about. This is something you go to God and you say, you know, I don't know what it is, Lord, but I, I love your church so much that I don't want any kind of disagreement between me and anybody there. Think about that. 
I love you so much. And I know your church is your body. I pray that you'll help me to do what I need to do. To do what's right. To serve you. To lean into you in this situation. And Lord, by the way, you know I don't feel right about it. And Lord, by the way, you know I've got some, some issues with it. Help me to understand what you're doing. Because who's in control? Let me understand what you're doing with this moron you put over that Sunday school class. Or, you know, this idiot that takes up the offering and drops the plate. I mean, just, we get, we get bent out of shape about all kinds of things. And so you can, you can just hear Paul saying, listen, pray about everything. Supplicate, name it. Be precise in your prayer. See, conversations, could you imagine if you had a conversation with anybody and it was just random? When you, when you ask somebody, say, how you doing? Well, you know. How's, how's mom and them? Well, you know. Is there anything I can help you with? You know. Could you imagine? But I think a lot of people's prayer life is that way. It's, and it's always in the King James English, right? Lord, thou knowest. Right? See, supplication is not that. Supplication is going to God and saying, I'm struggling. So-and-so is struggling. They've, they've given me a prayer request, and it's a burden on my life. Lord, I pray that in, in just pray in that situation in detail. But do it with thanksgiving. Now, if you're having a little squabble, as these two ladies were, it's hard to be thankful. Lord, I thank you for Martha. Even though I can't stand her hairdo. <laughs> and that perfume she wears. And I know, I know she took that spatula that's got my name on it. <laughs> but I'm thankful for her. When we're truly thankful for people, and we truly know they love the Lord and the Lord loves them, if we just love the people God loves, we do better, don't we? Some people are difficult to love. I like to say that, and that is very true, and y'all know it's true. So what do we do when people are difficult to love? We pray. Lord, help me to love as I should. Or even this one, Lord, forgive me for not loving as I should. I'm in the wrong, Lord, because I don't love this person like you love them. So a lot of times we think, well, they did that to me. That's on them. Or, or we have all kinds of reasons that we want to sort it out. But, you know, God says love them. He doesn't say if they do you good, love them. He just says love them. And a lot of times we don't want to love who God wants us to love. And that's a sin. That's not doing what God wants us to do. A lot of times we don't recognize it as sin. Lord, you know I'm full of faults. And God says, I call them sins, not faults. But if we would do what we do, pray in specifics when we're having conflict, when we're having great day, if we would just pray, as Paul says in Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. And supplicate to ask specifically. And that word supplicate means to beg. And then to do it with thanksgiving. Thank you that you heard me. Thank you that I have this opportunity to pray. Thank you that I know you're going to resolve this for your glory and for my benefit. Right? If we understand that everything works for his glory and our benefit, then we can pray in a thankful heart. And the, and the Bible says in the Old Testament, in Psalm, to enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise. And he's saying the same thing here through, through Paul, his writer. Do this with supplica do, and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God, which is that specificity that's involved in that prayer. What's your request? A lot of times our prayer is, Lord, fix this individual. And God may be saying, what I need to fix is your attitude about the individual. How about I just chain y'all together for a little while? <laughs> Have y'all seen people that do that? Got two kids fighting. They got this super 16X t-shirt. Put both kids in one t-shirt. And they got to live together. I think God does that. Oh, you have a problem with so-and-so? Well, let me just put you all on the same committee. <laughs> Until you get to know them enough to, that you get to love them. Because a lot of us are porcupines. We've been hurt. We've been offended. So our first reaction when we get around somebody who just maybe thinks differently like, if you're an introvert, you're around an A-type personality, A-types will wear you out because they're always on, right? And a lot of times introverts have these porcupine quills they put out. They've been hurt. They don't want anybody close. And so 
you could draw so close and then you can kind of feel there's just a little bit of a fence there. And next thing you know, God's going to work on you until you love enough to trust. Even if people hurt you, they hurt Christ. But what he do? He stretch his arms out anyway. And so with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Here's the result. Here's the payoff. You're having trouble. You're not at peace. If you're having a squabble, you're not at peace. If you're having difficulties, you're not at peace. If you're not at peace, you're not where you're supposed to be. And the problem is you. If you're not at peace, it's not anybody else's fault but you. Have you ever met somebody that just never gets bent out of shape no matter what somebody does to them? Oh, that's on them. I bet that's hard earned. I know I'm not there. But I know people that's like, you got to let people be people. You got to love them like God loves them. I'm like, <laughs> but how many of you know the peace of God? How many of you have had it washed into your life? Maybe a good example is that a loss of a loved one. Where that peace of God comes in, you're like, I don't know why. I've had so many people tell me this. I don't know why, but I'm at peace. And we're still standing in the hospital. I don't know why, but God's given me peace in this situation. And that's what Paul promises here. He says, and the peace of God. When you meet these other criteria, the peace of God, which surpasses all knowable instances, surpasses understanding is what it says. The peace of God is beyond what you understand. God's peace, when we're where we need to be and we're loving the people that God wants us to love and we're leaning into Him and it's for His glory and our benefit and we're serving Him and everything we do is an act of worship, even if it's bringing box cookies on a Wednesday night or, or if it's just going around picking up a gum wrapper, some other idiot left in the pew, right? You bend up pick up at church, uh, that gum wrapper, you can say, I wonder what idiot did that. Or... You say, I'm, you know, let me, let me get that, Lord, it's an act of worship. You know, giving is an act of worship. Tithing is an act of worship. Don't write that check begrudgingly. If any of y'all still write checks, I don't know how that works anymore. Well, we don't have kiosks where you can use your card. But write that, Lord, this is my offering to you for your kingdom. Thank you that I have the ability to write that check. Act of worship. Change the way you look at everything. If you consider everything an act of worship, you consider whatever you're doing. See, we're not called to worship God one hour on Sunday. We're called to worship God 24-7. We're called to be in worship 24-7. And a lot of us will say, well, I didn't know that. I thought I just had to be right when I come through the doors on Sunday morning. Well, if, if that's when you get right, you're not right when you sit down. Because you've got a lot of things you probably need to talk to with the Father about just the previous week, much less the last 10 years. Paul says, listen, do this, and the peace of God, it surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Again, we come back to Paul's famous, in Christ Jesus. That's where everything has to operate. So if our minds aren't in Christ Jesus, and our lives are not in Christ Jesus, then the peace of God is not there either because we're mad at somebody that we have no business being mad at because we're forgiven and we should be forgivers. We should be able to pray for folks that we don't understand. We should be able to plead for folks that we know that are struggling. We should be able, as in Galatians says, when, when you see a brother that's overtaken in a fault, be spiritual and go help them overcome that fault. We should have that kind of love that we don't say, I knew that was going to happen. He'd been playing with fire and he got burnt. Well, that's not what he needs at this moment or she needs at this moment. She needs somebody. He needs somebody that's going to love them enough to say, I have fallen myself. Let me help you. And that peace of God that is beyond understanding will guard. That word guard is also translated sentinel. You know what a sentinel is. They're at their post. And they're watching for anything that's going to come in to take what they're guarding. And so God's peace is like a sentinel in your life. The, the peace of God will guard your hearts. There it is. That surpasses all understanding. This peace guards your heart and your mind. So you've got to see the emotion and you've got to see the intellect. Some of us have stinking thinking. 
we saw something happen we didn't think it should have happened. They painted the walls the color we didn't think it should have been painted. Bought the wrong type of chair, bought the wrong kind of pew. Some of us have stinking thinking. Or something happens and we'll say, nobody talked to me about that. Ooh, really? Well, Jesus, I didn't know this was your church. I know it sounds hard, but that's just true. It's okay if things happen you didn't know about it. Now, it's not okay when things are hidden and sneaky and things are done behind the scenes and done that way on purpose, but just because you weren't notified that something happened, there's no sense getting bent out of shape. You get bent out of shape over it. Now, you can voice your opinion and say, well, I sure would like to be notified in the future. Then somebody who can make sure that happens should say, I, did, I, I should have done that. I'm sorry. But there ain't no sense getting all bent out of shape over it. Nobody's targeting you. You know what's happened? Your peace has been attacked. It's no longer being guarded. That happens. When somebody can do something that affects your mood, that shouldn't happen. You say, well, wait a minute. You don't understand. When something bad happens, I fly off the handle. Mm -hmm. This verse is for you. Well, you, you just don't understand. I've got an anger problem. Mm -hmm. This verse is for you. Because, see, when we're where we need to be and we're leaning into Christ and we're living a life of true worship, not self-worship, Jesus worship, the things that happen will be like, Lord, you saw that coming. Bless their hearts and do your thing. Keep serving God. Keep worshiping God. Keep praying. You see something happen you don't understand? Pray about that. Go to God. Make your supplication. And it's through that process of trying to do it the right way. See, that's the problem. God says there's a right way to do things. And as I said last week, we have the American mentality. I have my rights. In America, you do. But in God's kingdom, you're a slave. Slaves have no rights. Slaves serve. And, and Jesus is saying, listen, here's the bottom line. You lean into me. Trust me with my bride. It's my bride, not yours. Trust me. If things are going on that need to be addressed, you pray about that. Sometimes you do have to step up like Paul and call out heresy. And so sometimes we have to do that. We have to stand against wrong things, stand against sin. But the individual, Paul says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We can lean into God. And that peace of God, that peace is a guardian of our heart and of our mind. And that's usually what we lose first in this battle. We start thinking about something somebody said. Or, you know, you walk into a room and the room gets quiet. First thing to attack you is not them, but your mind. I know a lot of us have minds that get crazy like that. They got quiet when I got in the room. It had to be about me. What are they talking about? And that can fester. And that can grow. But you just go to the Lord and say, you know what, I don't know what's going on in this situation, but I, I feel like they were talking about me, but I have no proof. So I'm going to lean into you, Lord. Help me in this situation to live above reproach. That's the main thing, to live above reproach. God sends his peace to guard, guard our minds. He also sends his peace to guard our hearts. And I know, and I have been, heartbroken in churches. I've had my heart broke by leaders that fail, by, by Sunday school teachers that fail, by, by servants that fail, um, by gossip, by just all kind of wicked stuff can happen inside a church. And if you don't think so, you're delusional. Because <laughs> it can happen in any church. Yes. But if you've got the peace of God, God guarding your heart and guarding your mind, you know he's in control. And you can go to him in prayer. And it you'll see that it has a less effect on your physical being because your spirit's being guarded. Your hearts and your mind are being guarded by what? The peace of God. Is there a greater peace than the peace of God? Is there a more powerful peace than the peace of God? If your peace can be shattered by something somebody said or did, it's not the peace of God. And that should be a wake-up call for us. We should say, I'm not where I need to be. 
my prayer life obviously wasn't where it needed to be because of what Paul says is true, then my heart and minds weren't guarded. This thing here got to me. And see, it's a wake-up call for us individually, not a wake-up call for us to become a mob and to then attack somebody, but to do it God's way. And I think all of this, all of Paul's teaching here, goes back to this little, not even heretical, just disagreement between these two ladies. And Paul's saying, listen, you've got to stop that before it gets over here. You've got to recognize it for the sin that it is and bring it to God. And it'll get fixed. But we've all been witnesses to where God didn't, they weren't allowing God to fix it. And you see the results when people get in their flesh. I have been in a church service and saw an argument go on among the preacher and the deacons and everybody else. And men were rolling their sleeves up right in the service. Mom got me and my sister. We went out back because it's getting ready to get hairy in that church. And everybody in the church that was involved in that thought they were doing the right thing. And they weren't. They didn't have the peace of God. They had this mentality. Christians, we're supposed to react differently. A lot of us haven't been instructed on the way we're supposed to react and the power in which we react that way, which is through the Holy Spirit, through the peace of God. So I think Paul's letting these two people know. I think this whole book was written so he could talk to them about this. Because, see, the church at Philippi was a superior church. They were a church of worship. They were a church of praise. They were a church of service. They, they were lined out. They were doing the good stuff. But Paul saw this little flicker of darkness. I think he wrote this whole letter to check in with them. He probably had a good excuse. He was sending Epaphroditus back. He was going to update them on how it was going. He was in jail. He was going to update them on all that. But at the same time, when you get to chapter 4, you get to his purpose. And he's like, y'all need to fix this. And it does us a disservice if we look at that and say, oh well. Or if we look at that and say, oh my. Be careful of the little foxes. Song of Solomon says, or is Ecclesiastes. Be careful of the little foxes. They ruin the vineyard. They pick out the little grapes. And they ruin the vineyard. It's the little foxes. The little things that God says, take care of this. You have the wrong spirit about this. You have the wrong attitude about this. This isn't about you. Have you ever had God tell you that? He says, I've been, I've been upset before and just felt like the spirit was impressing me to, to understand it's, it's not about you. God had to tell Samuel the same thing. Samuel was like, Lord, they've, they've rejected me as judge. And God says, they have rejected you. They've rejected me. Don't internalize this, Samuel. It's all about me, not about you. And the same thing's true today. God doesn't need a guardian. Does he need a guardian? God is the lion, right? You don't have to defend the lion. You just open the cage and let him out. He'll take care of business. We need guardians. We need to check ourselves. Because self is the problem in any situation where two people aren't getting along. Self is the problem. We hate to admit that, but it's the truth. Let's end there with a word of prayer and we'll close the night out. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to go through this. Father, I pray that we can learn from the instruction, that we can see that Paul was so serious to this church that Father had this very small problem, that these small problems become big problems quickly. Father, help us to always check ourselves, to lean into you. Father, we can't fix anybody, but we can allow you to fix ourselves. And so, Father, we pray tonight that you'll just give us the wisdom that we need, that when we, these things are creeping up in our life, that, Father, we'd stomp it out before it becomes a raging fire. Father, thank you again for your word. All these years later, the effect that it still has today. Father, I give this to you that you will do what you please in everybody's life. Father, take anything that I said that's incorrect or inappropriate, Father, out of their minds. That, Father, they can understand your perfect will and purpose. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.